Great. All right, let's get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Cunningham. I'm the AVP for Alumni Relations here at Lehigh. And this is a Mountain Talk webinar. It will be recorded. So if you have to drop off early or you have friends that you think would like to see this, uh, we will send out a recording after the webinar. Um, just a couple little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we will um, end at one o'clock to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and the way that we uh, get your participation in these webinars is by using the chat. So if you uh, take your mouse and um, look at the very bottom of your screen, right in the middle, there should be a, um, a bar and there's a chat icon there that looks like a cartoon balloon with a couple dots in it. So click that and you'll see a window that comes up um, and it will have a uh, webinar chat. And then there's a thing that says type your message here. Um, and if you type a message in there and hit uh, send, then I will see that and I will read your questions um, to Suzanne so that she doesn't have to be squinting and, and reading the questions while she's also answering. Um, so uh, before we get, we get started, I'll just do a very quick introduction. Um, Suzanne uh, Edwards is here. She's been a professor at Lehigh for 12 years. Um, she got her master's and PhD at the University of Chicago and her BA in music and English at Amherst in Massachusetts. And I learned uh, just before this webinar that her instrument is her voice. So um, if you ask in the chat, perhaps she will sing a little bit for us. <laughs> um, Anyway, she is a professor of medieval literature and feminist theory, um, and she's going to talk to us today about sexual violence in medieval times and um, how it relates or doesn't or does uh, to today, especially around the Me Too movement and all that's going on there. So she's going to speak for five to 10 minutes, and then we will open it up for your uh, chat questions. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. I am muted. How's that? Better. Okay. Hi everyone, <laughs> thanks so much for being here. Um, often when I tell my students that I teach feminist theory and medieval studies, they're kind of puzzled by the juxtaposition of the two things because they think of the Middle Ages and feminist interests as antithetical to one another. Um, but for me, um, there are two key reasons why pairing those things together are important in my work on sexual violence. And the first is that I think it's important to disrupt the idea that we sometimes have about a narrative of historical progress. I think, um, I think often, you know, my students have this conception of the Middle Ages as incredibly backward and horrible. The most often, the comment I hear most often when I tell my students that I work on sexual violence in the Middle Ages is, oh, there must have been a lot of that back then. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes that idea that everything in the Middle Ages was horrible and backwards props up some complacency about how good we have it now. Mm -hmm. That becomes a way to sort of think like, well, at least the way things are now is so much better. <laughs> it might not be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so when, you know, when we get into medieval texts, what they see is that perspectives on sexual violence in the Middle Ages were complicated mm -hmm. as they are today. There were horrible injustices, just as there are today. Mm -hmm. And there was some really subtle and thoughtful um, understandings mm -hmm. of about that injustice and what could be done um, to address it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's one of the reasons why I think pairing the two is, is helpful to sort of um, shake the sense that we're doing really well mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the second the second reason for me why that's an important um, an important pairing um, specifically in my work is that you know if we think about the Me Too movement it's shown how important it is for survivors to have a sense of community. Mm -hmm. But that sense of community and um, recognition of others' experiences uh, has important political and mm -hmm. personal effects. Um, and I think that holds true for the ways that we talk about histories as well. Seeing survival of sexual violence, seeing survivors of sexual violence in the past can be an important resource in the present. 
And when I first set out to write my book, which was published in 2016, you know, one of the things that I saw was that scholars had spent a lot of time talking about uh, legal understandings of rape in the Middle Ages and debating whether particular representations were examples of sexual violence or whether they were examples of something else. But fewer people had talked about how were medieval writers thinking about survival. Survivors, how are they thinking about survival? And it turns out there was a really lively discussion about survival in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, in part, if you look back to antiquity, you know, in the story of Lucretia and the founding of Rome, in, in that story, Lucretia is raped by a tyrannical king and commits suicide. And that, that story was cited as a kind of um, moral value for women. And then following the sack of Rome in 410, uh, in which many women were raped, Augustine, um, a theological thinker, came along and said, you know, suicide is not an appropriate mm -hmm. response here. Survival has value. Mm -hmm. Survival is important. And he was, you know, he was saying that in response, I think, to the women he was talking to, um, the women whose stories he heard. Um, so I think survival paying attention to survival is important. And I think, you know, we can see some exciting connections there too. Like if you think about um, a sort of precursor, I think to the Me Too movement, Emma Solkowitz's mattress protest at Columbia mm. University. This is a Columbia University student who carried around a mattress um, to protest the university's uh, handling of her rape allegations against a fellow student. You know, the discussion about that, um, the discussion about that protest focused on how it recalled um, the Stations of the Cross mm -hmm. and the Passion narrative. Mm -hmm. And that pairing of sexual violence with that Christian iconography mm -hmm. is something that we see all the time mm -hmm. in medieval texts. And that raises questions about, well, what's the continuity there? Mm -hmm. And also it helps us to think about who's included in the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and who's left out. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do Christian ethics still inform the kinds of survivors that we listen to and the kinds of survivors whose experiences we value? Mm, interesting. All right. Um, thank you for that um, great introduction to the topic. Um, so the uh, let's get to some of your questions. Again, to, um, to ask a question, you open the chat box. You can find that at the bottom of your screen. Just click on the chat and it will show up um, and then type a message in the box there and hit send. Um, and while people are typing their questions, um, I wanted to ask, um, you do some research around survivors um, and the, the concept of innocent until proven guilty mm -hmm. uh, for the accused. Um, how does that relate to today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, I think when we talk about sur survivors, one of the things that I do in my work is to sort of show that survival might be separate from legal frameworks. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we think about the law as setting the mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. for what counts as sexual violence. Mm -hmm. But I think what count it only sets the standard for what counts as sexual violence mm -hmm. in the law. Survivors' mm -hmm. experiences don't always match up with right. the law. Like if we think about Emma Sulkowitz, for example, the university found um, found the, the student who she alleged raped her not responsible for that. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't make her any less of a survivor. Right. Um, so, so I think one of the things that I try to do in my work is to sort of be clear about what the law can do mm -hmm. and what it doesn't do. Mm -hmm. And I think a good example of that, there's, um, you know, many people don't know that Chaucer, the famous poet of the Canterbury <laughs> Tales, <laughs> Um, was charged with mm. what, what was called in the legal document raptus, which is mm. a Latin term that might mean abduction or it might mm. mean rape uh, by a woman named Cecily Champagne. Mm. And his friends paid money, so she dropped the charges. Yeah. Um, but d was he guilty or was he not? We don't know. Right. I, but I think the bigger question is what's at stake mm. in, in trying to decide that question and living and what, what does it do when we just sort of settle that we don't know what happened, mm. but we know that she alleged that. Right, right. And that. Huh. I could think about that for months. <laughs> <laughs> Years. <laughs> um, we have a question from Andrew. 
Um, do you think there's a difference between the campus setting and the real world? Well, I think that's a really, that's a really good question, yeah. and I think, um, and I and I I would approach that question by thinking about the Middle Ages. Actually, not not surprisingly, perhaps, um, you know, a lot of contemporary activism around sexual violence has focused on college campuses, mm -hmm. and to some extent, that's a bit of a surprise because we know if we look at data of college-aged women. Um, who are not enrolled in colleges and universities experience sexual violence at a rate that's higher than mm -hmm. women who are enrolled in colleges and universities. So one of the questions that crops up is why does so much activism focus on the college setting mm -hmm. when we know that it's a much broader problem than that? Um, and I think if, you know, one of the cases that I look at in the Middle Ages is a legal reform from 1382 it sort of was redefining what sexual violence was and redefining it specifically in ways that protected elite women, that protected mm -hmm. parents, um, parents' investment in managing their, their daughter's sexual autonomy, mm -hmm. the inheritances that would be due to mm -hmm. women. And I think there is a parallel to be drawn there. Those legal reforms focused on elite, elite women. Um, and I think we can understand the focus on sexual violence on college campuses as likewise focusing on elite women, mm, yeah. women for whom autonomy is valued differently mm. than it is for, um, for other folks. Well, I also wonder, like, if you live on a college campus, you are just more independent of your parents anyway, and you're in more of a community that's in a finite space, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Andrew says, interesting. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And um, so while we're waiting for others to ask, I, the, the notion of the students, um, mm -hmm. when all the Me Too started emerging, mm -hmm. did you notice a difference in your classroom, the dialogue that people were willing to have now versus before? Yeah. Was there a turning point? I, I mean, it has definitely made the conversations in the classroom more resonant, mm. and it has really prompted students to want to draw those connections. So I'll give an example from the graduate class that I'm teaching this semester. The graduate class is on gender and sexuality in the Middle Ages, and we spent the first part of the semester reading a lot of uh, virgin martyr lives. Mm. These are saints' lives about young women who, you know, most often they're sort of um, threatened with either coerced marriage mm. or sexual violence at the hands of some um, uh, tyrannical ruler, usually. Um, and part of that part of that narrative often includes her speaking back to authority in, mm. a, in, in a setting. And my students were drawing some really interesting, mm. in a legal setting, were drawing some really interesting connections to the Kavanaugh hearings. Mm. And we're thinking about how um, Christine Blasey Ford's appearance before the Senate Judiciary mm. Committee, um, you know, and speaking in front of a uh, in a political setting that was mostly men, right? Not exclusively men, but mostly men, echoed some of the things that they saw in the Virgin Martyr. Interesting. Lives. Yeah, yeah. That that scholarly approach to it is a fascinating way. Um, we have a question from Brad Morse. Um, I once saw a woman obviously flirting with a group's leader, who eventually commented to the effect that you know I'm not flirting with you. The entire audience of about 200 burst out laughing. It was also evidence to all that she did not think she was flirting with him. Does this rift in awareness explain some of the surprise of men um, versus the victims? That there's still this, I would think like the men are from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, one of the debates that we were having in medieval studies was kind of distinguishing what's a seduction narrative mm. and what's uh, a rape narrative, mm. you know, and there was a, a lot of critical debate about that because a lot of these narratives that had previously been classed as seduction narratives, mm -hmm. you know, really had an element of coercion, mm. an element of power difference. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think those sort of, and I think that's a place where 
talking through those issues in literary texts actually helps all of our students mm -hmm. to understand and to think through what they're seeing mm -hmm. and how different perspectives on the same issue are influenced by the positions of the people involved. Mm -hmm. You know, so like there's a, this genre of narrative called a pastorelle in which a knight encounters usually a shepherdess or a, um, a, you know, a woman somehow out in the fields. And, you know, there's elements of both the language of courtly love mm -hmm. and of violence. And one of the things that's really useful to talk through in the class is how they're not hearing each other, mm. how the knight understands it as a seduction narrative and how it doesn't feel that way to the woman involved because mm -hmm. for her, there's such a power differential between the two of them. Interesting. Huh. Um, so we have a question from Jeff Gilbert. Um, while you've spoken about how law and legal discourse provides one definition of sexual violence and survivorship, we've seen that the Me Too movement was also largely a media-driven conversation. Yeah, I guess there wasn't Twitter back in <laughs> medieval times. <laughs> in what ways, if any, was uh, did the media grapple with sexual violence during the medieval era? Um, he also, Jeff Gilbert says, so thrilled to be back in a Suzanne classroom. <laughs> oh, well, hi, Jeff. I'm so thrilled that you're back in the, in the classroom. Um, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think that is a really interesting question. Yeah. I mean, we don't, it's definitely the case that all the narratives of sexual violence that we have from the Middle Ages, with a couple of exceptions, are filtered through you know, a scribe, mm -hmm. <laughs> either the scribe who's writing down the legal case or a poet who's telling the narrative mm -hmm. or who's um, writing down a response to a story that a woman has told him. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty rarely getting those stories from, <laughs> from the women mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the questions we have to ask ourselves about and I think about any narratives around sexual violence that we encounter, mm -hmm. who is this for? And what political aims or purposes is it serving? Mm -hmm. who, who is it serving? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why the sort of survivor-centered focus is so important. Mm -hmm. We need to have conversations that are serving survivors. Um, and there were all too few of those mm -hmm. in the Middle Ages. I mean, mm -hmm. when I'm looking at, when I'm trying to find survivors in medieval texts, they're often buried under mm -hmm. layers that are not about them. Mm -hmm. um, so it takes some, you know, patience and creativity to, to figure out, figure yeah. that out. Yeah, interesting. Um, Albert Hinchman asks, what can be done to improve the investigation process of sexual abuse complaints on college campuses to mm -hmm. determine if the complaint's legitimate or illegitimate and ensure the rights of both the accused and accuser and protected? Yeah, and I think this, you know, this is a question that cuts at the heart of one of the things I'm interested in. I think legal processes, juridical processes, mm -hmm. which is what's happening on college campuses right now, mm -hmm. are always going to be inadequate to the needs of survivors. You know, because a legal process needs to, you know, a legal process is not in the case of sexual violence is not good at attending to a survivor's experience mm -hmm. because it's trying to judge the situation as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I mean, I would actually flip that question around a little bit. I mean, I think there's a huge debate about what investigations mm -hmm. should look like on college campuses. And I think it's, it's interesting to me that we're having that conversation in a robust way about college campuses when in fact, if we look at uh, rape cases in um, state <laughs> courts, mm -hmm. it's much worse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a much more problematic. Um, so one question we could ask is why is there such a focus on figuring that out in the college setting when mm -hmm. we should be asking those questions about how do we talk about sexual violence in the law more broadly? I think mm -hmm. it's really shunting off those concerns onto college campuses mm -hmm. as opposed to really addressing the issue more holistically. Um, but I also think I would advocate for, and I think this is something we do on Lehigh's campus really well, actually, thinking about the needs of survivors beyond um, the punishment of a perpetrator. Mm. How can we support survivors in a way that, that goes beyond adjudicating the guilt or innocence mm. of parties involved and taking survivors seriously about what their experiences are? Mm. Um, I, survivors sometimes want 
punishment of, of their attackers. And sometimes that's not the thing that they need. Hmm. And, and, and um, I think if we had more processes for addressing survivors' needs that aren't limited to juridical proceedings, mm -hmm. we would be better off. That's interesting. Um, Cheryl's question is, what mis misconceptions, if any, do you do modern people have about the sexual politics of the Middle Ages? How could those misconceptions inform today's dialogue about mm -hmm. sexual violence? Wow, thank you yeah. for that question. Um, I mean, I think the biggest misconception I see is that um, rape was considered trivial in the Middle Ages. That's not the case. There was people understood that rape was an ethical wrong. In fact, Augustine, for example, is like offended by the idea that anyone would think mm -hmm. that women are responsible for their own rapes or are guilty in some way for the violence perpetrated against them. Um, no one thought it was trivial. Legal remedies existed for women. In some cases, their male relatives brought those cases. In some cases, they could bring the appeal themselves. Um, that's actually what happened in the case of Jeffrey Chaucer. The woman herself brought the complaint. Um, so I think you know that's one of those misconceptions where people think the Middle Ages was so backward, we have it so much better now. It's a way of not taking seriously the problems we're still grappling with today. Um, I think another, and I think the, you know, but there is an, a grain of truth to that in the sense that the, the higher status a woman was, the more likely her claim of sexual violence was to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that too remains true today. Mm -hmm. That's something that we can also learn from in the present. Yeah. Uh, Vivian's question. It seems that men in power are constrained, knowingly or unknowingly, by a sense that believing women equates with relinquishing power. How do we handle this? Wow. I mean, well, I guess I guess that question, it sort of depends on what relinquishing power means. I think um, it's possible, I think, to believe women and to have a robust debate about what that means should happen next. Um, I mean, you know, for example, um, in the case in the case of, you know, like one one way this question, I think, comes up for me, particularly as a literature scholar is, you know, what do we do about artists who are charged with sexual violence? What do we do with their art? <laughs> um, you know, that's the case for, for example, for Roman Polanski, the filmmaker. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the case for Juno Diaz, uh, the, the novelist. That's the case for Louis C.K., the comedian. What do we do with their art? And I, I think what we've seen in the case with Chaucer is there was a phase where people thought that believing Chaucer might have committed rape meant that would mean that necessarily we had to stop reading his work. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I do think it, I do think what it, what it means is if we believe Cecily, if we believe her charge, we take that charge seriously. I think that does mean we have to change where we under, how we understand Chaucer's relationship to representations of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. When he's, he's not a good resource for thinking about, um, he's not a good resource for centering survivors because we know, we know this. We know this about his history, or we believe Cecily. And we can also believe that maybe that's not how he saw it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the question about what to do after we believe women is an open one. <laughs> Mm, yeah. And do you, I know your work is primarily in medieval times, mm -hmm. but do you sometimes dabble in other eras to see what, <laughs> you know, what lessons they've learned or how that? Yeah. I mean, I really think of my work as going back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, between the present and the past. Mm -hmm. And what I learn is from that back and forth movement. You mm -hmm. know, I learned a lot from the protests. Yeah. from Emma Sokowitz's protest. Yeah. yeah. And you know the way that that brought survival to the front of the conversation. Um, you know, I learned a lot from contemporary feminist theorists that send me back to medieval mm -hmm. texts with new ideas. You know, for example, one of the things I thought about a lot is, you know, there's been a real change in the way that we treat sexual violence in international criminal court and in international mm -hmm. human rights law where 
you know, after the work of feminist legal scholars, uh, rape is now treated as a crime of genocide, and in some ways is equated to, to, to or is associated with murder. Mm. Um, you know, a, a legal scholar at Harvard, Janet Halley, has said, well, that there's a problem with that to treat those two things as the same, um, although she certainly can see the advantages to it too. And that conversation took me back to some medieval texts to think about, well, what are the cases in which um, international conflict uh, or inter in intergroup conflict involves sexual violence mm. um, and focuses on survival rather than on martyrdom mm. or death? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Stephanie's question is, can you talk a little bit about how you feel media, such as The Handmaid's Tale, impact the narrative? Are these productive? Wow. Well, I mean, I think they're, they're certainly productive of a conversation. And I think these are conversations that we really need to be having and working through the complicated questions of justice mm -hmm. and belief and witnessing survivors. Um, the stories that survivors are telling us. I mean, I think, um, you know, with The Handmaid's Tale, one of the things that we have to remember is this is a fictional representation. Mm -hmm. This is, and, and we need to be careful, I think, when we're having discussions about issues related to sexual violence, about distinguishing between um, women's accounts of their own experiences in legal settings or extra legal settings and fictional representations of sexual violence mm -hmm. that, you know, are, are, those are doing, they're related certainly, but they're doing different things and we need to keep that distinction in mind. But I certainly think The Handmaid's Tale is productive in terms of thinking about, um, you know, thinking about how cons women's sexual autonomy or consent can be constrained in all different ways. Yeah. I guess it sort of goes back to what you were saying before, using the past where people don't have a personal connection or a personal story makes it easier to talk about, yeah. right? Because you're just, you know, hypothetically, you know, a thousand yeah. years ago. Yeah, and yeah. I think, I mean, I think in a way, looking at the medieval text for students especially offers a different kind of critical perspective. Mm -hmm. It allows them to sort of approach their most deeply held beliefs about the present moment. Mm -hmm you know, through a lens that's historically distant, but culturally proximate. Right, right. And that, that really helps, I think, unlock students' um, understanding of the complexity yeah. and ethical and moral urgency yeah. of these issues. Well, it almost brings, you were talking about uh, women finding community, and it's like the community has a, another, like a time continuum. You know, that yeah. it's not just the survivors of today, but we're all in this together, like from the beginning of time. Yeah. And society has struggled with this since day one. Yeah. You know? And I think also it, it helps remind us that sort of thinking about communities of survivors entails both recognizing continuities mm -hmm. and shared experiences and differences. Yeah. Not all survivors speak with one voice. Mm -hmm community doesn't mean that survivors are in unanimous agreement right. uh, or that their responses to sexual violence are the same. Mm -hmm. Women and men handle sexual violence and respond to it in different, different ways. Right. Um, and you know, whatever we can do to develop um, a response, a cultural response to sexual violence that attends to continuity and difference, the better off we'll be. Yeah. So speaking of communities, Stephanie says, beautiful, beautiful perspective. Thank you. So wonderful to see you, Suzanne. Oh, Stephanie yes. DeLuca here from your oh, 2010 Chaucer Club. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. So sounds like you've got quite a few uh, oh. former students and fans. Um, so that brings us to one o'clock. That half hour went really quickly. Um, I'm so glad that you all participated again. Uh, you will get the recording if you had to drop off for any reason. But thank you so much for sharing this. Um, very interesting and uh, productive and um, had a big crowd today. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye bye.